since day one. Hi, I'm Coach Mia. Thank you all for tuning in to Season 2, Episode 4 of GLOW 365 TV, our greater level of wellness. Please don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube at Official Woman of Culture, and culture is spelled with a K. There you'll see all our previous and current shows. Greetings, GLOW fam family. We have a special topic dealing with autism for today's show. However, we are looking at it in the contents of the sad fact that people of color and diverse ethnic groups suffer disproportionately for, from the so-called disease of civilization. In this show, we are going to explore what that means. But first, let me introduce my esteemed co-host, Sophie G, a relationship coach and at the end of the show, she will sum it all up with her words of wisdom. Hi, sister. Hi, Glow team, Glow family. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Yes, we have a great show. Looking forward to it today. And of course, it's just you and I, you know, in the big chair tonight, and Lady Q and Dawn um, on yeah. a little vacation. So, yeah. Shout out yes. to them. Right? They're sipping margaritas somewhere or lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm drinking my water. I'm minding my own business. Woo. All right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. You got the mic. Well, you know what? Um, today is a beautiful day, as we said before. And we, are, we, we do have a great show lined up for you today. You know, um, today we're going to be talking with somebody who's a very remarkable person. Um, you know, he has uh, been here on this platform, platform before, pretty much. Um, and we're going to be really highlighting Autism Awareness Month, which is the month of April. You know, many of you, many of you probably don't know that um, April is Autism Awareness Month. April, we bring awareness to focus on sharing stories regarding autism. This is to increase understanding and acceptance of people with autism and foster worldwide support. Autism or autism spectrum disorder, which is otherwise called ASD, refers to a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills and repetitive behaviors, speech and nonverbal communications. And um, again, we just want to really take this time to, Mia, I, I think, you know, you want to jump more into it, into regards to what, who autism affects. Sophie. Um, now, you know, according to the Center of Disease, um, autism affects an estimated one in 44 children in the United States today. There is not one autism, but many subtypes, most of which are influenced by a combination of generic and environmental factors. Because autism is a spectrum disorder, each person with autism has a distinct set of strengths and challenges. Our special guest today will share more insights on that. But before, let's take a quick break. And when we return, I will introduce our special guest, activist 
Marcus Ford, who will share his story of living with autism. We'll be back in 60 seconds. The Jamaican American Association of Central Florida proudly presents Jamaica's 60th Independent Scholarship and Debutantes Award Gala on August 6, 2022 at the Rosen Plaza Hotel from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Guest speaker will be Dr. Dwayne Dice, CEO of Education Solution International. Co-MCs are Mr. Lewis Witcher and Miss Adriana Clark of Caribbean Rhythms Radio. Dinner served at 7.30 p.m. Music and dancing by DJ Charlie Brown and Caribbean Groove Band. Tickets are $75 by calling 407-467-1741 or 321-439-2130 321-439-2130 and also 407-292-3719. Join us for a night of excellence and elegance as we celebrate Jamaica's Diamond Jubilee. For more information, please visit online at www.jaaocf.com. Yes, and welcome back. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to attending the Jamaican American Association 60th Independence Diamond Jubilee in August, celebrating Jamaica's independence, you know. But um, let's get to um, our guest here. In KO Magazine, June, July, August 2020, our journalist, Ronnie Hawkins, shared an exclusive interview titled the man, the voice, the mission of overcoming many obstacles and challenges after being diagnosed with autism. Today, he's making a difference in raising awareness as an advocate and activist for those on the spectrum. His mission is to encourage, educate, and be the voice of the voiceless for those living or caring for people with autism. First, Let's watch a short video about activist Marcus Boyd. You know, again, we are so honored to have him here today. Um, it being Autism Awareness Month, you know, uh, you'll find that he dispels a lot of myths about people with autism. And uh, Marcus Boyd, born in Atlanta, GA, he is a four-time award-winning autism activist, first African-American to receive this award, a 13-time award music producer and composer. He plays multiple instruments. He is a rapper, an author, film producer, producer of a clothing and shoes line, where, uh, I can't wait to hear more about that. He is a, also, he was also uh, in the KU Magazine's 2020 Ribbons of Survivors 365. He was the autism ambassador. And I want to just take this time to give a warm, beautiful KU Globe welcome to Marcus. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our show. Listen, I'm honored and I'm and I'm grateful to be on this platform. I'm finally on Globe 365 TV. Grandma, I'm here. <laughs> 
we love you, man. We just love your spirit. We love your suit. And we know the radio land and TV land is waiting to just fall in love with you right here on this platform as, right, as well. Right, Mia? Yes. And, you know, I want to say um, a special thank you to Marcus um, because the intro, you saw the glow, the music in the background. That is his music that is playing for our now intro glow show. Mm -hmm. I'm honored. I'm honored to, you know, have an opportunity, any opportunity to help push and, you know, push the mission forward. Awesome. Now, Marcus, we want to get into, you know, talking about you, um, you know, coming from a young man, you have accomplishments um, with being awesome. However, you were not able to speak before you were 10 years old. Your childhood was filled with a lot of abuse emotionally, physically, uh, sexually, and being labeled different or intellectual disability before you were diagnosed with autism. Now, um, do you remember what life was um, like before you were 10 years old? Uh, yeah, I remember up to like I was four. Um, it was really, really rough. And, you know, my parents had 22 of us. So basically, you're trying to deal with per child, per emotion. And unfortunately, you know, they didn't have they didn't have guidelines about autism in the late early 80s. And so, you know, my parents didn't know what it was. My grandma said I had a demon and I need to go to church, get it prayed over, get it prayed out, stuff like that. The normal stuff. Holy oil. Wow. First of all, growing up with 22 siblings. Wow, that must have been an interesting, interesting, you know, household, brother. Um, but let me ask you something. It, it, you know, it, it said that you were not able to speak before you were 10. How were you able to communicate before then? Well, actually, I was not able to speak until I was 13, 13 and a half. And when I started speaking, it was at a two-year-old's level. I didn't start speaking like this until I was almost 18. Wow. Um, so before then, it was really nothing. And... You know, my sisters was teaching me with sticky cards, hooked on phonics, muzzy, the big white Bible, you know, the one with the yellow stuff. <laughs> so, I mean, anything they can get their hands on, Curious George, Big Red Dog. I, I, I think my sisters done read every children's book they ever made. Wow. So how did you communicate back then? Well, actually, I pointed the stuff. I, you know, if I wanted something, I'd grab it. If I wasn't grabbing it, I make noise to let them know that I want to be in this area. Or they'll take me to an area. Again, my sisters, all nine of them, they just had this nurturing spirit. So they was able to help me push through my communication. Was there one thing that really enabled you to, to speak that really pushed you, that really stands out? My speech therapist, her name was Anna Gibbs. So her daughter was my peer, my team um, speech coach. So to be honest, I had a little crush on her daughter. So, <laughs> uh, so you know, her daughter was trying to teach me how to say hello or hi. So I think when I was 13 and a half, I said hello for the first time. And I was stuttering trying to say it, and I didn't come out all the way right. But I, I forced myself because I really wanted to talk to her. Wow, it might be amazing what a little crush can do, huh? <laughs> a little crush can give you a little incentive. <laughs> God bless the crush, brother. <laughs> yeah, that's a great motivation. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Wow, wow, wow. So we know that you endured. Did you have any help outside of the immediate family to help you cope with um, all the challenges, you know, um, and emotions that you probably were feeling then? Well, I don't want to lie to you on this TV platform, but unfortunately, um, other than my sisters and my grandmother, there was no family. There was nobody there to help care. They didn't do anything. I had a lady by the name of Dorothy Carr, which was Tina, my best, Tina's best friend. Um, which is my biological mother, she took me in her home. She, you know, really took the time out with me. And she was an intern at the time to be a social worker. But she didn't care about her job. She cared about me first. 
Wow. You know, Marcus, I want to um, take one step back. Um, what was the first thing you said and what was your reaction? Um, it was at Dalton Carr's house. The first thing I said was, I want a peanut butter and jelly sound. <laughs> PBJ? And my reaction was when she, she gave me extra jelly on the sandwich and stuff, it was on wheat bread. I mean, but that, that's besides the point what it was on. <laughs> but I was shocked that I was able to say I want peanut butter jelly. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. So you actually said peanut butter jelly or PBJ? No, I said peanut butter jelly. Wow. So, you know, Dalton Carr always had great jelly. So I didn't, I, I, I praise God, I didn't have to go strawberry or grape. Like, <laughs> <laughs> do you still eat that today? Yes, I do eat uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or regular grape jelly sandwiches. It doesn't really matter. Wow. Mm -hmm. I feel you. My granddaughter, she loves some peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hello. No, an Austrian. Uh, why were there an Austrian uh, American uh, psychiatrist and physician, Leo Karner was his name. Um, he first decided or described autism in 1943 and wrote that children with autism were gifted in terms of intelligence and they had an extraordinary memory. We know now that autism was, uh, we know what it is now and that um, even Sometimes today, even though we know what it is now, sometimes today there's still um, so many people who are misdiagnosed. Um, some it referred to as a, a schizophrenia or mental reader. You know, and, and I'm saying it now because we're on this platform. Even though this is not a forbidden word, um, back then it was described as a schizophrenia or mental retardation. No, let me just say this while I'm putting it out here that. Um, this is a word that's no, no longer used or acceptable in, mm -hmm. in, in social settings, and for, rightfully so. And I think, you know, here we are to enlighten and to share and to educate as well. And we just want to let you know that I'm, we're using it in this terminology because of what it was and how it was described back then. Right, Mia? Yes. Um, so, but, but now we know that, you know, it, it all stemmed from uh, uh, his Leo, what was his name? Leo Kenner. He referred to it as something that's known as it was, it was stemmed from uh, cold parenting, um, which marked an extensive criticism, criticism from parents who were controlling, who were set in unforgiving ways um, and guidelines as to how they were raising their children and because of their behavior. You know, Maya, I know there's also another terminology now that they're using for that, the flip side of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when they didn't have that, you know, that understanding how to, you know, handle that child uh, um, with autism, or they didn't know what autism was. Um, now, you know, on the other hand, they call that uh, warm parenting as a therapy to speak to them in a friendly tone to um, provide regular um, support children need, you know, that consistent confirming them um, to kind of help them along the way, you know, and not going back to that co-parenting on, you know, how I want you to speak, what I need you to do, and they don't know how to communicate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, John e, John John um, Edgehill just said, sadly, many children with autism are never diagnosed and are misdiagnosed. Um, she's thanking you, Marcus, for sharing your platform with us. And and you know, while we're on that, I just want to ask you, Marcus. With all that being said just now, what are your views on parenting and um, as factors that would make uh, autism more survivable based upon your experience? Um, charity starts at home. So basically, it, you know, to say that you're not going to be upset when your child first get diagnosed, to say that you're not going to feel sad or depressed, to say that you're not going to feel angry, to say that you ain't going to want to probably blame God, your baby father, your dad, everybody else, because of why this have to happen to my child. Nobody knew that Marcus was going to speak ever. You know, when they said, 11 different doctors said, okay, his brain will never function. He's basically a walking vegetable. His brain doesn't function correctly and stuff of that nature. He'll never get an education. The thing is that parents have to have patience and love. And yes, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. There's going to be valleys you're going to have to climb. But at the end of the day, God gave you that special gift and that special person for a reason. 
He's never going to put too much on us that we can't bear. So the problem is a lot of parents want microwavable results. And it's not microwavable. I still have autism, and I'm next year I'll be 40, January. So I still will have autism for the rest of my life. I still have emotional behaviors. I still have trigger points. I still don't like certain noise that bothers me with sensory. I still can't eat certain um, food because of the color texture. I still have, you know, um, my situations going on. But at the end of the day, it starts with love and guidance. That's what Dorothy Carr gave me. She had 50 other kids on her caseload as a social worker. But she was there every episode I ever had. She was there every school function. She was there when she didn't have to be. Yeah, that is awesome. You know, it's nice to have that, you know, caring um, social worker, just someone there to just, you know, help you along the way. Now, you know, Marcus, we know today that, you know, with all the studies that they've done that, you know, autism is a lifelong disease, as you just mentioned, um, you still have it. It's not going anywhere. And some of the symptoms are, you know, uh, delayed language, uh, cognitive and um, learning skills, uh, even ep epilepsy and seizure disorder and mood and emotional reactions, just to name a few. Um, Marcus, um, you formerly was diagnosed at age 10, um, as you mentioned. Um, how was your autism discovered and what was your reaction? Um, it was based off my behavior. When I was, you know, rocking in corners, when I was using the bathroom on myself and stuff of that nature, because, you know, I had difficulties using the bathroom on myself. So I didn't start doing that until I was like 18, 19, where a child would stop doing that around two, three maybe four and stuff of that nature. I mean, you know, I had very, very violent behavior in school. I couldn't stay in school. I had a, I had a, um, well, they call them peer specialists now, but it, back then Bob Ordner was called a behavior aid. So um, my grandmother was tired of taking me to churches. So a friend of hers told her to take me to Clifton Springs Mental Health Center and go see Dr. King. And Dr. King, um, said that I had severe autism or, or other words, classic autism. He sent her more recommendations to other doctors in Georgia. Those doctors sent her to other recommendations to other doctors in New York because we was going back and forth. So you're talking about 11 different doctors in two, in two states basically said the same thing. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you know, you just answered a couple of the questions I was going to ask you just no. So, you know, um, that must have been um but you look where you are now you know i was gonna ask you if there were there were any kind of a special therapy that aided you in getting to where you are once you started seeing the doctors and all of that was there any special kind of a treat, treatment therapy or exercise that you had to do that brought you to where you are now i want to say it was because of the doctors i would say it's because of my grandmother my sisters and my behavior aid and because of Dorothy Carr. See, we're talking about a different time frame. We're talking about 30 something years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know what they do now, but back then it was, you know, it really was a village. Like everybody had each other phone numbers, stuff like that. Like um, when Tina and Tommy didn't want to deal with me, Dorothy Carr would come from a 12 hour shift and still deal with my moves, my behaviors. And she'll still have Bob Orton to come over to her house. Uh -huh. Now, your biological parents, um, when the doctor informed, you know, that you had autism, how did they react? Well, honestly, my grandmother had to call Tina up. I don't want to get people confused. Tina's my biological mother. Um, you know, I just don't feel like calling them mom and dad because they have never earned those titles. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my grandma called Tina up and told her, that, you know, the doctor was saying this stuff and my grandma was like, you know, we're going to pray and we're going to put, you know, God in this and stuff of that nature. And simply before my 14 hung up, she said, well, his 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 mental all word is your problem. She hung up. That was it. Wow. And um. I'm so sorry, man, but I know this has made you tougher, though, stronger. Do you remember um, how old you were at that time? Was it, was it six years old, I think you said it was, um, when you were separated from your mom? 
Well, I was separated actually at four, but I ain't really get into foster care system until I was five and a half going on six. Because for that year, I was with Dorothy Carr. So when when Big Tommy broke my ribs at four, mm-hmm. Dorothy Carr came to the hospital to pick me up because Tina was bailing him out of jail. That's why she couldn't get there. Let me ask you a very sensitive question. I know it's all sensitive. Mm-hmm. At, that, at that tender age, and I don't know, you, what, you know, this is what we're doing now is, is also aiding other mm-hmm. persons that's watching and probably going through it or maybe even a child who's listening over somebody else's shoulder or watching the screen behind them who's probably doing, going through the same thing you're going through or having been. Do you remember at that age when you were separated, why you were separated? Did it make sense to you at that time when you were taken from your mom or left your mom to go be with, you know, grandma and, you know, at that age, were you on um, what was going on and why you were separated? Actually, my, we went to New York at the time my grandma was staying in New York. So we all went from Georgia to New York all 22 of us. And my mom said that she's going downstairs to the bodega, the store, to get some bread. Mm-hmm. I'm 39. You let me know when she come back, okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, now. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is, woo. Now, this, this question here, um, actually, the statement I want to read, I want to make sure um, I read it correctly because I was like blown away. Um, and I think this was, you know, part of the interview we did back in, you know, 2020. Um, you were the first male foster child in the state of Georgia in 1989 with autism. Yeah, I was, actually, it was 1987 in Decatur, Georgia, because at that time in Decatur, Georgia, they didn't have foster kids like that. So they had a foster girl, a Caucasian girl, and then they had me in 1987. And there was 16 foster homes and 17. 17. Wow. That, there was 17 that, foster homes, 16 group homes. 16 um, M hospitals. I don't want to. Um, 16 hospitals for um, situations and um, for inpatient. I mean, we talk about electrical shock therapy, needles. I mean, <laughs> that's why the book's on the way. That's why the book is on the way. <laughs> that's exclusive. All right, now, man, that, that had to be devastating, you know, as a child. But um, how did that affect your self-esteem and your, your mental health? Okay, well, since we're on the glow show, <laughs> um, <laughs> I try to commit suicide 54 times in my lifespan, anywhere from bleach to trying to hang myself, to cut myself, to shooting my leg. I mean, I tried everything. I haven't had a, a liquid charcoal so much. I think it's a flavor. Um, I didn't have a self-esteem. I was always depressed because I never had friends. My sisters was my friends. They used to come to my class. They used to come to my lunch. And they didn't go, no, they was not even in my school. They was, they was older. Some was younger, but most of them was older. They, they didn't go to my school, but they was there every lunch. Every time I had lunch, they was there. Every time I changed class, one of them was there. Mm. So that mm. I wouldn't feel like I didn't have a friend. Because I had nine of them. Wow. Mm. Wow. Now, Joan says, I'm so sorry for all that you went through. Thank God for your life. Amen. Yes, yes indeed. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, Miss Joan, definitely I'm honored. She sounds like an inspiration. So I'm definitely honored. And Joan is actually a um, multiple myeloma cancer survivor. So, yeah, she mm. gets. <laughs> yeah definitely mm. definitely yes. inspiration definitely a role model definitely i'm honored yes well we know that um we can only imagine and based upon some of the stuff you shared with us right now um that you know even being in and out of foster homes how that may have affected uh, being in and out of the homes um was there any sp- how did your foster parents react once they found out that you were 
again, I know. again, we talk about early 80s, late 80s, early 90s. They didn't use those terminologies. Oh, he has autism. He's autistic. They they just used there's something wrong with his N word. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's the all word. Mm-hmm. Uh well look, shoot, I'm getting I'm getting this yellow check for him every month anyway. They sending this target JC Penny clothing voucher for him a month anyway. So we going to keep him. I don't have to worry about getting the job. That's 2400 a month. Again, I don't know what they do in foster care now. I don't know the what they pay or or whatever. But back then, they, they, they was paying checks. So basically, they really didn't do anything to help you cope or to grow or, you know, understand, you know, um, what you were going through. No, because back then, anybody can be a foster parent. Mm -hmm. I don't even think they did background checks like that. Mm -hmm. HIPAA law, they didn't really have those type of things in place. Anybody could be a foster parent. And and it's not just a movie on on something you see on Lifetime. This is real life. I, I had Caucasian foster parents, Jamaican Oh, it doesn't really matter the nationality. And to be honest, my dad is full blood Jamaican, but my the foster parents that was Jamaican, they abused me more than any foster parents I ever had. Oh Jesus! Wow. Oh. On behalf of all the Jamaicans and the rest of Jamaicans, brother. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, I understand. Listen, they said it. Uh, Listen, at the end of the day, they was just about money and checks. They used to spend my clothing voucher money on their kids. So, I mean, I get it. I get it. You know, you get in something for what you think you can get out of it, not to teach love or nurture a child. That's not, that's at that time, they wasn't trying to do that. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to um, jump into this real quick. Um, based upon some of the, and all, all that you, you know, the stuff you shared with us. You know, we know that there, there are quite a few other, um, there are quite a few um, things that go along with being diagnosed with autism. Um, how, how did that socially affect you in interacting based upon being, you know, you know physically touched, your daily routine changes? Um, sensory overload, which you mentioned earlier, and sometimes even what could possibly have triggered anxiety and all of that, um, and maybe even led to, did there anything lead to panic outbursts and all of that? But how, how, how did that int- affect you in socializing eventually once you started to, um, you know, get the therapy and realize what was going on and being more understanding as to what's going on with you and how you could possibly cope with your coping mechanism? On your journey, how did all those affect you? Did well, you, you have to understand, at first I was nonverbal, so, you know, it was just Dorothy Carr, Berta Looper, that was my therapist and stuff of that nature. So even as being nonverbal, I relied on them. So when I became verbal enough to be able to form little sentences here, there, whatever, whatever, I still relied on them. So mm-hmm. I didn't really have a lot of friends or I didn't really have a lot of uh, people that wanted to hang with me and stuff because you have to understand, I was using the bathroom on myself in school, recess and stuff of that nature. So kids was always making fun of me, poking me, trying to fight me and stuff of that nature. At that time, taking my dollar 50 cent. Again, I'm showing my age because that brought a whole lunch. You understand what I'm saying? So um, I didn't really have any coping skills. My coping skills was this plus size woman who had runs in her stock and called off the car. You know what I'm saying? God bless her. You know what? I am so I am so blessed that you have I'm, I admire your attitude right now. And I know that that, that came from part of your survival. You know, I know that's just just observing you and even talking before we, we came on live, just how your personality, you know, persons, let me just tell you, TV land, that um, Marcus, his personality is so contagious, his bubbling magnetic personality is so <laughs> contagious, you just want to pull him through the screen and just all give me like a big teddy bear. <laughs> we were cracking up before the show started. Oh, and yeah. All that said, humor, I'm sure, probably came from learning how to just take life and not let it 
or take you based upon your 54 experiences that you shared with us just now? You know what? Um, we can we can all cry. Everybody has trials and tribulations. Yes. My trials and tribulations is no better than nobody else's. It's no greater than nobody else's. I'm the same as just everybody else. But at the end of the day, what I got taught by my grandmother is don't let your disability make room at anybody else's dinner table. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Activist Boyd. Amen. <laughs> Brother. Yeah. I can definitely relate to, to that. You know. Yep. Don't let it, you know, be that um, kryptonite, as I will call it. You know, you got to push through. Now, you know, we've heard so much about, you know, artism and um, the misunderstanding and um, the miseducated and all. What um, has been the most frequent misconception? Uh, people seem to have about um, autism. Marcus? That we're invalid, that we can't do stuff, that we need it, that we need constant help. Each individual with autism is a different individual. You're not meeting the same individual. There are some individuals with autism who cannot do anything for themselves, but there are some who can. So, you know, rather they use titles of high functioning, middle, low fun, whatever the functioning value is is still these people can do anything they put their mind to. And just because of a diagnosis or a label doesn't encripple them of not becoming to their greatness. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a myth that, you know, we always have to have supervision. We can never be nothing or do anything for ourselves. And we always, you know, going to cause problems in public, have have tantrum tantrums or emotional behaviors. And, you know, we have to have a group of people around us and stuff of that nature. I've been on my own since I was 16. Next year, I'll be 40. Wow. So there ain't been a group of people around me because I've been homeless for almost three years. So there ain't been a group of people around me. Wow. You know what? I know we got to take a break, Charlie, Mia. But I was just thinking, I can't wait to get to the part where you share with us how and when you learned that you had all these gifts, these creative gifts, gifts of becoming a musician, you know, playing the multiple instruments, of becoming a record producer, of becoming a TV. We can't wait to hear all of that, right, Mia? I can't wait. I'm getting yeah. chills. Author, everything. I mean, he, he's man. doing it. So, hey, we're going to be back in, in 30 seconds. Jeez. This is Stacy Elevated Wilson, and you're listening to Star Straight Talk with Amazing Reality. Join in every Thursday at 8 p.m. on WOKB 1680 a.m. and 100.7 FM in Kissimmee and listen to Miss Jackson. She is for real with Michaela and Julian. Welcome back. If you just joined in or just tuned in, we've been having a really, really, really intense, very, very passionate conversation uh, with our special guest today, uh, Marcus Boyd. He is an advocate. He is an activist. He is, uh, he, he's, he's here with us sharing his journey with autism, um, you know, and, uh, for, for his entire life and how it affected him and how it brought him to where he is right now. Uh, being a, uh, uh, I don't even know where to say, multi-talented, selling <laughs> at all these these different these different uh, attributes and and skills of being a, a, a multi-award recipient of being a mu Please tell us how you got here, how you got here, my brother. Um. It's because of Mary, Mary Boyd. That's my grandmother. It's because of her. You know, I remember. I was 14 and I told her, I wrote to her in, in the notebook paper, I want to be like my brothers. So at the time, my brother was doing a little bit of um, pharmacy work, if you will. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I told her I wanted to be like my brothers. So she put, she, she took me out of the downtown Brooklyn and she there was a fence right there, lower level. 
She said, all you got to do is run past me and jump this fence. She said, if you jump this fence, I give you five hundred to a thousand dollars so you can go ahead and get started and be like your brothers. So all you got to do is jump this lower fence. So she she said, I'm not even going to start to start to watch until you run past me. So I ran past her. At least I thought I did. I, I collapsed right at her legs and I was wheezing and, and stuff. And she said, you see, you fat and you wheeze when you sneeze. She said, I wheeze when I sneeze. So she said, I need to stay in school because a drug dealer is not in my lifespan. So she put me in band camp through the church. <laughs> and I've been in band camp ever since. It went from band camp to concert, marching band. It went from marching band to poetry session. It went from that to going to Atlanta, being introduced to, at that time there wasn't signed, but being introduced to some really well-known music producers. When I was 15, they gave me my first Acer laptop and Fruity Loops 1, the demo version. Again, I'm showing my age. I said Fruity Loops 1. They're probably like, like 13, 14 right now. <laughs> but they taught me about digital instrumentation about beats per minute, about counting, about counting beats and counting bars and counting melodies and harmonies. And one thing led to another. And now we're here almost 23 years later. Mm. Wow. Wow. I mean, he's a master at music, playing multiple instruments, um, became a rapper, and now a successful um, filmmaker. Um, during that time there, you know, were you um, bullied when um, first indicated that you wanted to embrace these activities? <laughs> bullied? Listen, okay, I'm from the project, okay? Again, I'm sorry, Glow TV 65, I'm trying to keep this political and correct, but I'm sorry. I'm from straight the projects. So, <laughs> we don't call it bullying. Some people call it hazing. Some people call it joking or whatever you want to call it. I call it everyday life, okay? You step outside, somebody's going to roast you about your shoes, your socks, your pants, how you look, if you slob. I mean, <laughs> your size. So it it was normal for me. I I thought it was I thought it was normal. It was like a like breathing fresh air. I was always bullied. Stuffed in lockers, money being taken away from me, the Grusha Park gang beating me up, which included a girl. So I mean, wow. <laughs> it's like <laughs> you know what? And that just made you stronger. But before you right, they was they was they was Chris rocking me. I'm sorry. I know I was supposed to say that. I am sorry. Sorry. We can edit that out. Right here. We're keeping it real, okay? We can edit that out. It's sorry. Show business, and it's like what's what's going on? Show business. No, it's like the talk. Uh, <laughs> But I want to know, and I know, I know, I just got a text message. Somebody wants to know what was the first instrument you learned to play? A wooden flute, because they was giving them out for free in Brooklyn. Mm. Through the and Baptist Church, and they was giving them out for free. And what a wooden are, flute. And then what it went about? to a clarinet, from a clarinet to a flute, from a flute to an alto sax, from an alto sax to a third, a, a third, a third line trumpet, from a third line trumpet to electrical piano, electrical organ, organ piano. I mean, hmm. wow. Did playing hmm. music um, affected your self esteem and prove it? It didn't start doing it until April uh, when I was 15, 1998. And it started doing it because I, I finally got a beat that, again, these guys was not signed at the time. But I finally got a beat that I was trying to impress them so much. They was like, oh, man, I really want it. Again, for all you music people out there, do your music business first. Don't just get excited because you got talent. Because they they paid me for a beat with some Jabo jeans, some Six Flags season pass, and two, two tickets to Sizzlers. Again, I'm showing my age. This looks like you get a whole salad bar for like $2.99, take a date and stuff for like $2.99. But that's how they rewarded me. And they made millions off that beat. Wow. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. But I'm interested to know as well, so from moving from the music, uh, how did that trans transition into TV, into filming? Well, again, I got to thank Tina Bridges 
TLA, um, T- TLA, TLB Productions in Atlanta, Georgia, award-winning film director, cast. Um, I just, again, I just woke up one day, brushed my teeth, and said I was going to do a short film. Called Tina. She said, let's do it. The rest is history. She didn't even ask me what it was about. She just said, let's do it. I was like, okay, I feel like I'm in a Nike commercial. So let's go. Wow. Wow. And I know you have a movie. Uh, we were trying to get a clip. I know you have a movie. Uh, and I want you to tell us a little bit about that before before we go and how we can actually see where we can actually, the, the, the viewers can actually see the movie and uh, um, if you want to really follow, follow upon that as well. Yeah, all you got to do is go to YouTube, type in mini movie, The Boy With No Voice. Um, It's like almost 20 minutes. Um, We shot, they shot that in Atlanta and stuff four months ago. Amazing cast, which is, we still showing it at film festivals and stuff across the United States. It won two major film awards in India. So um, I'm really excited about that because this movie is about some of my life with autism. And this is not coming from somebody researched or a guardian or a parent, I actually have autism. So I just wanted to show a little bit, a little, a little bit <laughs> of what I went through, you know, when I was younger. God bless you, man. Congratulations, brother. Congrats for all your, your accomplishments and what you do. Now it's your film, you you know, you're raising awareness, you know, with autism. Um, tell us about the other things that you're doing um, your foundation, your clothing and shoe line. Okay. So the foundation is called Marcus Boy Foundation and, um, that will be up and running soon. Just getting a little, little small, little stuff together. Shout out to my team, Kathy Taylor, everybody over there. Shout out whole team. Um, the clothing line, the A collection, which is formulated from autism community. Everything I do is, is autism. The, the A3 shoe line, we started with the puzzle piece shoes, but we're moving on to new designs and new products and stuff of that nature with the shoes because we want to respect everybody's views and, you know, their thoughts on different things in the autism community. Um, the coloring book, we about, that's, that's, we about to be able to put that, you know, everywhere, stuff like that. The autobiography book is on the way. I'm working on a children's book. Yeah, see, coloring book. Yeah, see, this guy. <laughs> this, yeah, this guy right here. Yeah. Right. Mark is the superhero. Yeah, I'm holding it up because you a hero too. You, you, and you, you a superhero. <laughs> yeah. Amen, man. Amen, brother. Amen. And I know while you're doing that, I think it's, it's let let everybody know. Um, apart from the superhero, that the name of your film. Is called the boy with no voice. Yes, right? yes. All right, the boy with no voice. Wow. That's the, also my autobiography. That's the same title, the boy with no voice. So these these little bit of snippet of stories that I've been sharing on this amazing platform. You get to read them in depth. Read them in depth and stuff. So proud of you. So proud of you. So proud of you. <sighs> well, I think we need to take a quick break. Uh, when we return, we will talk a little bit more with Marcus. He's going to be telling us about self-care tips from finding inner peace, spiritual awareness, wellness, and some nutrition guidelines. We'll be right back with Marcus Boyd. <laughs>
Welcome back again. You know, we are talking with activists um, for autism, Marcus Boyd. And, you know, we're coming near to the end of the show where we're going to talk about a little bit some self care tips. Um, of course, it's so important to create a strong support system to take care of ourselves, to handle everyday challenges, accomplish our goals, and the ability for potential growth to enjoy each day. With what um, uh, some of the self-care tips, um, healthcare regimens, uh, Marcus, um, do you do on a regular basis? Um, self-care tips, you know, got to make sure you take that good hot shower. You just need time with, with yourself and God. You know, make sure you play some church music. Um, I listen to um, acronyms. I listen to people like Les Brown. Uh, my big brother, John McClellan Jr., um, I listen to positive affirmations every morning to be able to get the energy flowing. Um, you know, me, give me a Gatorade and, you know, some good music. I, my regimen is I, I have headphones, a bunch of them. So I have to listen to my beats. You know, I got like 80,000 of them. So I got to listen to my beats <laughs> every morning. Um, you know, I am working on my health with eating more green vegetables, with um, drinking more water. Um, thanks to my queen for that. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, just really watching what I eat, trying to take more walks, you know, 15 minute walks a day. You know, that may not seem like a lot to people, but, you know, I'm kind of big. So a five minute walk for me is like five miles. So trying to do different stuff. You know, they say that there are certain foods that uh, persons with autism, with certain strains of autism, uh, um, should avoid eating that causes gastrointestinal issues. Um, are there any special food that's uh, that diet that you're on? Are you recommend being on that's probably gluten free or not? Or uh, what's your take on that? Um, or stuff that people I don't really know because again, everybody's dietary um, diet is different with autism. I only can talk about mine. Again, um, I'm I'm eating more green vegetables. Um, not a lot of starch. Um, I me personally, I stay away from grapes and I stay away from like cantaloupes and stuff like that because I don't like the color texture. Um, you know, certain vegetables I, I can't eat because I don't like the color texture. It bothers me. It's like a trigger for me. But um, other than that, I, I, I would suggest anybody try anything healthy that's going to make you and your body improve, whether you have autism or not. Did you ever think that you would have become a spokesperson for autism? No. In a community of such a, that is so overlooked? No. Listen, okay, that was never, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I'm glad God said, Marcus, you have no choice. Mm. Sometimes when we want another future, when we want to be on another path, God said, nope. I said, go right. Why you keep going left? I said, go right. Yeah, you want that, but you're not going to get that. Go ahead and wave bye to it. You're going over here. Mm. What has been... Um one of your greatest um, fear of people, even without autism, um, speaking in front of people, especially um, strangers. Um, how did you overcome that fear, um, if you had any? Um, normally, like I'm gonna use this example. I was in Atlanta, so normally my big brother John McClung Jr. Every live speaking engagement, he was there, like literally, like I was here, he was right there, like right beside me. I don't care if it's a concert, event hall, a festival, a school board meeting. He was there. I mean, so I always had to have somebody right there with me. But moving to out of state, moving, you know, I I still have to be fighting for autism. So I just pray to God first, close my eyes and let the Lord do his work. Because sometimes it's nothing but God with this situation. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. You know, um, for those who are watching, 
and those who are trying to take something from this, hopefully. You know, it's been, uh, data has shown that, uh, researchers, that persons with autism are, are so creatively artistic. And you've, you've proven that um, in the story you've shared. You know, um, what would you say to listeners, parents, foster parents, um, persons who have, who may think are not, not sure as to what it is, if it is even autism, what is it that you would say to anybody who's listening or watching right now? Um, what kind of advice would you give a person who's not sure, who may think they have a child who's probably acting a little unique, who's not talking much, who maybe be playing with a toy that looks like they may not speaking, but maybe they want to play with the keyboards a little bit more. Any kind of advice or suggestions or recommendations you would say to anybody who's watching this right now? I would say that if you think it from your heart, but you don't want to say nothing to your husband or you don't want to say nothing to your wife or you don't say nothing to your family. If your first mind thinks just a little bit like it may be something wrong, it may be something that's not right or whatever. Please have your child, your teenager or your adult, because a lot of adults get tested in a later age. So please have them tested because you don't want to wait until they get 10, 11, 12, 13 or whatever. When you could have got them tested, start really understanding the process and really take this head on. Because, again, it's not like, OK, well, they're going to grow out of it. You know, they ain't going to do this no more. I'm nobody's doctor. I'm not a medicine. I can't tell you if your child or a person will ever talk or whatever. But even if they're not talking, they still verbal. So I will say, if you see it, if you feel it in your spirit in any type of way, please go get them tested. The earlier, the better. Well said. Wow, definitely. Well, Marcus, we have come to the end of the road. Oh, and I was just God, enjoying, God. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> We love you, but man. before we leave, you know, um, I want to thank you so much, you know, uh, for being here. You know, I was so honored um, that we were able to feature you as our cover story, you know, in 2020. And I learned so much about you and um, you're my superhero. I mean, you're amazing. I mean, is there any final words that you'd like to share with our viewers that, you know, we didn't cover? You know, where can we follow you and, and all that? Um, the website, autismactivistmarcusboy.com is, is getting done, is on the way. But until then, Facebook, Marcus Leonardo Boyd, uh, Instagram, Autism Activist Marcus Boyd, or uh, Marcus the Interviewer, um, Twitter, um, Boyd at, at Boyd Autism, or Autism Activist Marcus Boyd. Please reach out to me. I'm not a celebrity or not anything else. Um, I'm, I will talk to you back and, and help any way I can. And my last words is this. For anybody who has autism, for anybody who has a child who doesn't have autism, always remember that your child is a gift. They're special and they're geniuses. They're creative. They're smart and they're loving and they can do anything. And I stand with you. I stand by you. I believe in you and I love you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, you know, if you're anyone out there um, that would like to book an interview with Marcus, you're in the Orlando area, you can contact me at email. I am KUO magazine at gmail.com. Again, that is I am KUO magazine at gmail.com and i will definitely get you connected with him and again we want to continue to raise awareness 365 not just in the month of april we want to keep this going as well again uh marcus you are our superhero our community leader of all time <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he is. He's wearing his cape, man. You see that cape? You see that cape. Thank you um, again for being our special guest today. Um, and um, we, we shared a lot of information, Sophie, 
that, you know, for those that are watching in, you might have tuned in a little bit late in the show. It's okay. Sophie G got you covered and she's going to break it all down. So, Sophie, it's I'm all yours. Saying, thank you, sister. Thank you, sister. And thank you, the brother, Mark, superhero. You know, I want to say, you know, we, we need to remember that, um, listen, as, 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 as Mark said, if you just tuned in and you think you missed it, maybe you can always catch the show on replay right here on the same platform. You know, and please remember to share it with someone who you think can benefit from it. Your family, your friends, your neighbor. You know, remember that, that word that people are described who are different or unique, who are on different levels of scale of the autism spectrum. Spectre. The R word is no longer acceptable. You don't believe me? Check it. It's in the Webster's Dictionary. It is referred to as intellectual disability. Intellectual being the operative word. Persons who are diagnosed on this spectrum are brilliant people. You, see, you saw it right here. They can become multi-award-winning producers. Many people behind a lot of the people who, are, who, who excel in the industries are autistic. If you don't believe me, remember Suzanne Boyle from uh, American Idol, Steve Jobs, Seinfeld, Thomas Jefferson, Michelangelo, just to name a few, just to name a few. Let that resonate with you. And remember that they say that persons who are autistic are different. But have we stopped to think that perhaps those with autism are the ones who are actually perfect if they're using their gifts and their abilities in the ways in which they're supposed to be used? Speaking less, listening more, using what they learn as an ability to make this world a better place. Could it be that the rest of us are just different? I think that we need to also keep in mind that um, it is important to be still because still waters runs deep. And never forget that the cornerstone that the builder refused may just sometimes somehow be that head cornerstone. Bear in mind that it is important to use the abilities that we have been given because get, guess what? Each and every one of us are uniquely and perfectly made in his image. Remember to find a way to be patient, be understanding, be caring, and find ways to eat better, walk better, listen better, be more patient to one another. Listen to what we learned here today, apply it to our lives, and remember in everything, read, meditate, be loving, be considerate because you never know when we may be entertaining an autistic angel. Right? So with all that being said, with all that being said, please, let's find a way to bring out the greater level of wellness in all of us. Find a way to bring out that brilliant glow. Until next time, please check us back right here Second Tuesday every month on this platform. We love you. God bless. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my sister. Thank you, Glow Team, Glow Viewers. And until next time, we'll see you right here. One love. And before we go, um, I'd like to share what is coming up in May. Of course, um, in May, Glow will not be shown. But we'll be bringing you season one, episode two of a special three-part documentary series presented by KO Magazine, Ribbons of Survivors 365. Our warriors of hope and wellness with five amazing women raising awareness in May for National Mental Illness Awareness Month. Join the conversation on Tuesday, May 10th 2022 at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with our special guest, Coach Don Hewitt, Coach Lady Q, 
Coach Maria Mixon, Ruby Marbury, and myself, Coach Mia, sharing our stories of thoughts and attempts of suicide to now getting to a place of mental wellness. Our panel experts will be special guests, Dr. Maxine Rudder, AKA Dr. Max, a psychologist and our host will be Leonard Berg. He's a soul therapist, psycho-spiritual coach, consultant, and the author of This Ease is the Cure. Again, I would like to thank our special guest, activist Marcus Boyd, my GLOW team, our community partners, Andrea Jackson, Star, Straight Talk, Amazing Reality with Miss Jackson, the Jamaican American Association of Central Florida, and Lima Dunbar, host and producer of the People's Chat Room. Thank you for um, sponsoring our show, um, this issue here. And I also want to thank my technical directors, my producers, you know, the bot behind the scenes that you don't see, that's Quidditelli Quayley, AKA, I know him as Cooch, and Catherine Murray Love, and you, the viewers. Thank you all for tuning in. I am Coach Mia Allman coming to you from Ocoee, Florida. Thank you all for tuning in to Glow 365 TV. Until next time, stay safe, well, and continue to find your glow within the mind, body, and soul. I am excited to officially announce that as we speak, Quayley Works is setting up the Quayley Works Empowerment Broadcasting Network. This institution will assist development groups in the U.S. and around the world to set up their own empowerment television channels. Our licenses and software enable these channels to be accessed through Roku, Amazon Fire, Chromecast, or Apple TV. Thus, ultimately giving us access to potentially 250 million subscribers. As part of that effort, we are launching our own Quayley Works self-empowerment channel in the first quarter of 2022. I hope you are as excited as we are. So stay tuned as the game has indeed changed. And for those who are interested in subscribing to our network, getting involved with this effort as a program producer, becoming an affiliate, or setting up your own independent TV channel, email us at quayleyworks at gmail.com.